Um, I, uh, I should add, I, I got involved with sustainable urban development issues when I co-wrote a book called Seeds for Change, Creatively Confronting the Energy Crisis, uh, which was all about Melbourne and alternative urban futures, um, which we published a week before Christmas in 1978. So I've been, yes, trying to do something in the urban space for a long time. And the last 18 months or so, I've been privileged to be working with APEX Low Carbon Model Towns Program, uh, the Asia Pacific Economic Community. And uh, as a result, I've had the very interesting and exhausting thing of visiting about 15 cities, uh, looking at their low carbon strategies and their successes and their not so successes and things like that. Um, and so it, it is, uh, I hate to say, as, as our Prime Minister, Mr Turnbull says, an exciting time to be involved in, in urban issues because uh, the, the pressures are enormous the opportunities are enormous and if we don't really get moving very fast we'll be stuffed. So on that note um, <laughs> I, I wanted to start off um, by maybe reflecting a little bit on what are some of the kinds of ways I see people trying to do stuff in the urban space. Oops, hang on, to find an error, that'll work. Right. Um, and uh, it's interesting when I look around at all the silos, and I guess anyone who works in a normal organisation knows all about silos and how fantastic they are at delivering something, often the wrong thing. Um, and this is an interesting uh, model of operation, and one thing that we said about it is that it usually delivers something, and it's kind of manageable, and because it's kind of tangible, and it usually aligns with the other silos around the place, so it can often even get funding and things like that. So um, there's, there's strengths in silos. Um, there are islands, often called the individual researcher or enthusiastic community worker, um, who are often lonely uh, and often duplicate their work because they don't know who else is doing things. Um, but they are also often creative and innovative and very focused. Uh, and they have very low management overheads. So uh, these are all interesting and important things. And then lastly, there's networks. And if there's one thing I've seen in the urban space is, have we got networks? We have so many networks, it is unbelievable. Um, and most of them don't know the others exist. And uh, so there is a really interesting issue here with networks because at one level they can be so powerful, they can help people communicate, they can build a global profile, they can uh, focus a direction and I think some of the sorts of things that, that Liz was talking about and Michael will talk about later show you some of the, the positives about networks. But uh, a lot of networks fluff around a lot and absorb a lot of people's time and don't necessarily make much of a difference. So we need to be careful about these things. And I wanted to touch on these because they are all important elements of the collaboration kind of processes that, that we, we need. Uh, it's just that individually, they're probably not enough. And that's where I was going to talk, oops, the mic's very close to my neck. Right, um, okay. Uh, I was going to talk quickly about uh, some other work I've been doing with a group that no one's ever heard of called the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity, uh, which is trying to double energy productivity in Australia by 2030. We've just done a big innovation study and we're, we were agonising about how do you structure things to empower people and open up their brains but still focus them on something practical. So we came up with something that, because of course we're talking about energy productivity, we call value chains. And this is really a very simplified life cycle analysis kind of thinking approach. And so you sort of, uh, I'll see if this works. Um, so you sort of think about what are the services we're providing? So we're providing nutrition with a food system at least maybe entertainment as well, but, you know, nutrition. 
And you know, with with buildings, we're we're providing shelter, um, affordable, preferably, and things like that. And the thing is that we we then sort of broke down the system that delivered this. So we've got in food, we've got the farm, the processing, the wholesaling and storage, the retailing, right up to you know cooking at home and all of that. And We've actually found, we've been quite surprised at how excited people have gotten about this because it's helped a lot of people who've been in their own little silos to realise they're actually part of a system that's delivering a service that could be quite a long way from them actually <laughs> in the systems. And, and it's helped people realise you can actually do things in different ways, like you can get bread at a hot bread shop or from a mass-produced big bakery, or you can cook it at home. You know, there's actually lots and lots of different ways of doing things, and that opens up the possibilities of innovation. But it also, once they realise there's a whole lot of other people in the game, it actually helps them become more open to networking and to respecting others who are active and, and things like that. So it, it's been an interesting experiment, and I think for people who are trying to run with networks, getting people to think about what they're really trying to do and what are the elements in the systems to deliver the services that the network is trying to provide can actually provide a focus and, and a, a collaborative um, culture which is often missing. Oops, okay. See, I'm used to pressing my... Okay, let's talk a little bit about PPPs. And I couldn't resist a bit of alliteration here, you'll see. Um, so what are these public-private partnerships? Well, the people and the public pay, yes. Um, or, and it might be the community or it might be the users of the facility or whatever, but they pay, There's, let's be clear. Uh, the proactive participants profit, uh, especially the financial people because most PPPs are packaged as a financial bonanza for certain people. Um, so that's all important. Uh, and of course, they should be particularly productive processes uh, because the whole idea of a PPP is to really focus a bunch of people on delivering an outcome, right? This is what it's about. And of course, it can be re the profit motive can drive innovation and enthusiasm and whipping and all sorts of things. Uh, or it can lead to cutting corners and having things crumbling a bit sooner than we expected or whatever. Um, but essentially PPPs, as I understand them, and Michael may educate me, um, are about delivering big projects cost effectively, uh, efficiently, quickly. Uh, but there's a problem of you might waste money on substandard outcomes, you might uh, because of the separations, you might bulldoze over community preferences, which is not exactly the collaborative model. Um, governments find PPPs an excellent way of shifting blame, uh, shifting risk, and being able to claim that they're debt free, even though they're paying double the interest rate on the financing of, ooh, of the PPP. Um, so, there's, there's lots of interesting dynamics around these uh, PPPs and uh, so that raises the question of how do these things work with collaboration? Um, and the interesting thing here is that when we step back from it in our society at the moment, there is disruptive change going on all over the place from every direction you can imagine and a few more. Um, we are trying to build social inclusion and ownership because when we see people like Trump and others, they're being successful because we haven't done that. So we've got to get that right. Uh, we need to negotiate and agree on lots of priorities. Uh, we need to understand where everyone's coming from and we need to get creative ideas. These are all really important uh, dimensions of, of collaboration and of, of moving forward. Um, yet at the same time, large and growing cities need high level long term planning and big projects. And that's what PPPs do. And when I was in Jakarta uh, 18 months ago, it was really interesting. If you drive around there, well, if you slowly move in the heavy traffic around Jakarta, there are these big concrete poles 
And apparently these are how far they got with several attempts at building a metro. Um, now, we were told by one of the Jakarta people, oh, don't worry, we've got the Japanese running it now, and they're really good, and they've sorted us out, and we're going to have a metro, which is really good, but um, I don't know if that was a PPP or not. But, um, so we have this problem. We need stuff. We need big things. But at the same time, what we're learning more and more, and in fact the APEC Centre here at RMIT is involved uh, with projects looking at financing of sustainable projects in the Asia Pacific, and they're all discovering that these traditional big lumps of money, big top-down systems, and all of that that ADB, the Asian Development Bank, and all those other people do, don't work for the new kinds of projects because they're bitsy and they're all over the place and lots of people are going to want to like each other and work with each other and things like that. Um, so one of the big questions is, can we make these PPP models uh, work with the kinds of projects that we want to be successful? And just to finish off, and not to really answer that question at all, um, Another thing I've been looking at is uh, in the energy space, this, this emerging, well it has been a battle that we've won, um, be between centralised systems like big power stations and stuff and distributed systems. And this, this table comes out of a presentation I did to the APEC energy ministers where I just tried to sort of look what, when you look at a whole lot of criteria like uh, economies of scale, flexibility of rollout, how you need capital and stuff. What we see is that the distributed solutions are really, really different from the centralised ones. So a distributed system, you can start off with a relatively small amount of cash. You can get a cash flow out of the first few wind generators or solar systems that can help fund what you're doing. You can learn more as you go really quickly Whereas to learn from owning a power station, uh, you've got to build it, it takes you 10 years to build it, and then you've got to run it for a while before you actually have any learnings. So there are a whole lot of interesting differences between centralised and distributed systems. And to be blunt, when you look at a time of uncertainty, uh, capital shortage, uh, and people who want to be empowered and engaged, the distributed solutions are killing the centralised ones. And, you know, that's what's kind of sad at the moment when we see our energy minister standing up talking about coal-fired power stations and, uh, you, know, you know, state governments harmonising their renewable energy projects, which, of course, is short for slow down, guys. Um, they don't get it. This is not how it works anymore because there's too many players with too many agendas and too many techni technical and economic alternatives. So, with that, I'll finish and hopefully uh, we can discuss some of this stuff later on after the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you.